afternoon, everybody. A couple of programming notes here at the top. First, I want to make sure you all are aware that the secretary will be delivering a speech tomorrow at uh, 2 o'clock on United States policy toward the Middle East. Uh, the speech will be delivered at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace as part of the launch of the organizations of that organization's Arab World Horizons Project. And, of course, the Secretary's speech is open to the press and will also be live-streamed on state.gov. For travel... Do you, do you have any idea about how long that speech about U.S. policy in the Mideast is going to be? Would it be a short speech or a really long speech? I think it's a normal size speech. Is he going to say anything new? Or do we need to cover it? Or what? <laughs> I mean, I'm being serious. I'm serious. I just told you how to cover it. And uh, I invite you at 2 o'clock to either go and listen to it or log on and listen to it. Will he actually explain to those of us who are curious what the U.S. policy toward the Middle East is? He will talk. He will, at, he will okay. talk in this speech about U.S. policy in the Middle East, and it's a region, obviously, that is of great concern, particularly these days, and lots to talk about. Is that a briefing tomorrow? Yeah, I'll still brief. I'll Sorry. probably have to adjust the time, though. I'm not going to brief it too while the president, uh, the secretary, is speaking, but uh, certainly I plan on briefing, most likely before. Uh, I also want to um, announce uh, this upcoming trip. Uh, secretary Kerry will travel to Austria, Kyrgyz Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and Tur Turkmenistan from the 28th of October to November 3rd. While in Vienna, the Secretary will hold bilateral and multilateral meetings with foreign counterparts to discuss the ongoing crisis in Syria. The Secretary will then travel to Bishkek, Samarkand, Astana, Dushanbe, and Ashgabat to conduct bilateral discussions with senior government leaders in each country. This will be the Secretary's first visit to Central Asia and the first ever visit by a U.S. Secretary of State to all five Central Asian republics in the same trip. In Bishkek, the Secretary will participate in the opening of the new campus of the American University of Central Asia and dedicate the new chancery of the U.S. Embassy. In Samarkand, the Secretary will participate in a joint meeting with the foreign ministers of all five countries. This meeting, a new format for dialogue between the United States and the Central Asian Republics, known as the C5 plus 1, will allow the Secretary and ministers to discuss regional and global opportunities as well as challenges. In Astana, the Secretary will participate in the fourth meeting of the U.S.-Kazakhstan Strategic Partnership Dialogue and deliver remarks on Central Asia's role in addressing global issues. While in Ashgabat and Dushanbe, the Secretary will discuss a range of bilateral and regional issues of mutual interest with senior uh, government officials. So with that, I'll take questions. So uh, before we get to the Austria stop, uh, which I'm sure you'll, you'll get a lot of questions about, I just the C5 plus one? Yeah. Really? You couldn't really. come up, no one could come up with something better? It works. The it's U.S. Big, and the stands. Yesterday, you guys were beating me up over the use of the word modality. I, I was not here. Yesterday. I'm trying to abbreviate C5 plus one. Right. I think it works. So quite does well. that mean are we going to go down the alphabet now? From are we going to have a D5 plus one, E5 plus one, at some point? There, there very well may, may be C such an effort afoot. Huh? C for Central Asia, or is it just C? C was the two. Yes, yeah, Central Asia. Okay. How Central wonderful. Asia. C Central Asia. Yeah. All right. That, that's the that's the general gist of it. <laughs> okay. Uh, on to uh, Austria. So, uh, do you know who yet? Who yet? Do you know yet whom with whom he will be meeting? Uh, as I talked about yesterday, uh, this there will be bilateral and multilateral discussions uh, in uh, Vienna on Friday, and uh, participation is uh, very much still being worked. Um, okay. I'm not going to get into specific invitations uh, at this point. Um, it's uh, except to say, and I'm mindful of uh, some press reporting out there uh, recently that. Um, it's important for us, and we've said this all along, the Secretary's talked about the, the need to make sure that key partners uh, are in these discussions. Um, and as I said yesterday, there's a, a, a series of bilateral discussions that are going on. Some involve the United States, many don't, as well as multilateral meetings uh, that continue to occur. 
Some involve the United States, some don't. The Secretary wants to encourage these kinds of conversations and discussions uh, as, uh, as we continue to look for um, <clears throat> solutions to what is a difficult political situation uh, in Syria and, and, a, and a transition that can be enduring and lasting and lead to a better government for the Syrian people. Uh, as such, uh, uh, in, in, in looking for different multilateral settings and for uh, the right key partners uh, to, be, um, to be present, uh, we do expect, uh, in this case, that uh, Iran will be invited to participate. Sorry, you used, you used the word key partners. Does that mean that the administration considers Iran to be a key partner? Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but I just mean that you need key, you know, as I said yesterday, there are many stakeholders in, um, in Syria and what's going on. Iran, though we do not uh, certainly by any means uh, approve of the destabilizing activities that they continue to pursue in Syria, uh, recognize uh, that and always have recognized that it, at some point in the discussion moving towards a political transition, we have to have a conversation and a dialogue with Iran. And so I wouldn't call them a, a partner necessarily, I, I, but obviously there are many stakeholders in this. Uh, and um, uh, and so we do anticipate right. that uh, Iran will be asked to participate. Now, whether they come or not, that's up, that's but up to Iranian I just leaders. Want, I just want to make I just want to make sure you, when you so when you use the word phrase key partners, you're not. I mean, Iran is clearly whether you, one likes it or not a player or an actor Iran, in the whole series. But, well, but let me put it but this do way. you consider uh, uh, them to be a partner, key or not? I mean, the key. They, they, it would seem to me your key partners would be the Saudis, the Turks, um, uh, and others, people who are in the Friends of Syria group, not necessarily those who, uh, like, not necessarily Russia and Iran. What I would say, Matt, is that uh, they could be. They could be. A uh, with partner. respect, Yes. But with they respect, are not now. I would not describe, right. based on their activities now, that, that they are certainly acting in partnership with the international community with respect to Syria, but, Matt, but, but they could be. Um, these are decisions that Iranian leaders have to decide to make. Well, Russia is the key partner, right? He said Iran and Russia. I'm not going to go down the list of every nation and define for you uh, the degree of partner. Russia has been a key partner on many global strategic issues, um, not to mention the Iran deal. And there are, there are plenty of other issues where uh, we can and, and want to, and in some cases do, participate uh, uh, or partner with uh, with Russia. Obviously, there are still issues uh, where there are sharp differences uh, with respect to Russia and our relationship with Russia. Ukraine being one. Hang on a second. Ukraine being one, and and clearly um, we want to see a more constructive role by Russia in Syria. So, could Russia be uh, a, a key partner with the international community with respect to a political transition in Syria? Absolutely, they could be. That is why. We're having these discussions. That is why there'll be another round in Vienna on Friday, and I suspect you'll continue to see um, more such multilateral settings to discuss the situation in Syria. And the participants, as I said yesterday, will vary from time to time. Uh, and that's okay, as long as the discussions are progressing and as long as some progress can be made towards achieving a political transition. And John, who would extend this invitation to Iran? Would it be the U.S. or would it be Russia? I, I, I'm, I, I'm not at liberty to say how or, uh, you know, an invitation would be expended, extended. I, I'm just going to tell you that, um, that we anticipate that uh, Iran will be uh, invited to well, the attend. meeting's coming up, so, you know, better hurry on that one. Thanks well, for the advice, Justin. I appreciate that. Have you invited them to this one? You expect them to be invited to discussions. Are you saying these discussions or future discussions? Yes. If I wasn't clear, we would ex we uh, anticipate that Iran will be invited to attend uh, this upcoming meeting in Vienna. And I understand that they have um, uh, that the Iranians have suggested a deputy foreign minister for this meeting, or has Zarif himself been invited? Uh, again, I, I would say that, as I said, they're expected to be invited. Um, how, whether they uh, accept that invitation is up to them, and, and if they do accept, 
uh, at what level uh, they want to send in terms of, of participant is, is up, up to Tehran. Is this kind of, are you just parsing around like the, the actual invitation? I mean, have you extended the invitation and they haven't accepted it yet? <coughs> or, I mean, what is it, that they haven't read it yet? I mean, or that they're invited and you're just waiting I'm to not, see if they want it to come? I'm not parsing any words, Elise. As I said, uh, we expect them well, what does to that, be Well, what does that mean? You're inviting them or you already invited them? Which is it? If I said if I said that we expect them to be invited, that would connote, I think, that it hasn't happened yet. Save the but date. But you've already yeah. kind of floated the idea with them into, about whether they would come, so are you waiting to extend as to the actual official invitation? Uh, I think I'm just going to leave it where I left. Well, can I follow up on, on my question? Was um, um, Is this an agreement with everybody who's, who's coming, including the Saudis, that the Iranians are to be invited? Well, I... Again, multilateral setting, many different perspectives. Um, uh, there's been lots of discussions about uh, uh, about participants, multilateral discussions about participants. Um, and again, I think um, the fact that I can tell you that we expect Iran to be invited to participate, uh, I think that fact speaks for itself in terms of in terms of uh, um, the awareness of, of other participants, of their potential participation. So the others have agreed then? The I won't speak for other countries. I, I, I can only speak for the United States. But the U.S. put out the invitations. I, I didn't say that. I, I didn't say that. I didn't say the U.S. put out an invitation. I said it's expected that Iran will be invited to attend. Point one, point two, it's up to Iran to decide whether they're going to or not when they are asked. And if they decide to go, who goes and who represents for them? Um, and the, other, the, the third point I said was that there had been multilateral discussions among other participants uh, about this aspect, and I would leave it at that, and, uh, and other nations can speak for themselves in terms of their, uh, their level of comfort. So then where does the Secretary want this discussion to go? If, if Iran is included, if Iran says yes, where is this... What kind of outcome does he want from this meeting, which I know is a continuation of? I, I, I'm loath to get ahead of discussions that haven't happened yet, Leslie. Um, I think I would point you back to what I said yesterday, which is that um, you're going to see more such meetings. The ultimate goal um, that everybody wants to get at. And I can't tell you how many more meetings it's going to take or how many more discussions are required to get at this goal. But the goal is to come up with a framework, an agreed upon international multilateral framework for a, a successful political transition in Syria, which is, leads to a government not led by Bashar al-Assad, and is, that is representative of and responsive to the Syrian people. That's the overarching goal. And as I said yesterday, that's a, that, that's a, a difficult task, certainly given uh, the ongoing violence that we're seeing in Syria uh, and all the different perspectives that many uh, partners and participants in these meetings have and espouse. We understand that. Um, so I, I can't tell you exactly uh, what the outcome of the meetings on Friday are going to be, or if they're, it's the last chapter, I, I'd rather doubt that. I think there will be there'll continue to be a, a more such discussions uh, with varying degrees of participation internationally. Um, so we just have to we just have to see. But coming out of this last trip to Vienna, the secretary f felt optimistic that um, that enough progress was being made towards laying down the foundation of what a political transition could look like, that he felt it was really important to continue that momentum. And, and that's what this, this uh, next meeting in Vienna hopefully will do. We'll build on this momentum. So when you say that you're looking for a framework for a pol successful political transition, are you talking about kind of some kind of roadmap with details about how long it would take what kind of you know governing transitional body would be in there like a sure. real like you did in libya like sure. i know that yes. you've made it not the same yes you know, i mean it would have to be it, it would have to it'd be a plan to, to to how how would a a a successful political transition uh, be implemented and affected um and all the components of that i i, I won't i don't want to get ahead of 
of any specific items, uh, because again, they're, they're still being debated and discussed um, and decided upon by uh, multiple participants. But yes, it would the, the essential components that you would expect to see um, in a government transition. Um, and also, I, I want to go back to something we discussed yesterday, <coughs> which is you know how the Syrian opposition, armed and unarmed, you know the political and the rebels, would fit into that. Because you're talking about a framework for a successful political transition in Syria, um, and yes, these are all the you know major non-Syrian stakeholders, but you're talking about Syria, and so how at what point do you need buy-in from the actual Syrians themselves um, to make this transition to to actually implement it? Well, certainly there's going to have to be a role for the moderate opposition, and we've said that from the very beginning. One of the big outcomes out of the Doha meeting or in the summer was a recognition that the opposition groups need to be more united and more unified in, in, the, in their approach in terms of what a transition should look like, and that the international community has an obligation to continue to work with them to that end. And we will, and we are. Um, I can't tell you, at least, exactly when or under what circumstances uh, you know, you'll see opposition groups um, unified to that point and able to speak with one voice at a table or in any other venue. Obviously, that's a key part of this. You talked about your question, you talked about a framework. Well, one of the pieces of a framework to get to a transition is exactly that, to be able to be inclusive of and to con and considerate of uh, the opposition groups um, and their desires and their needs. And we're going to get there. Are we there right now? I don't think so. But that doesn't mean that we aren't talking to and continue to have a dialogue with various opposition groups. Uh, uh, Special Envoy uh, Ratney continues to have, and, and will do so, continue to have discussions with various opposition leaders as we continue to move forward on this process. Can you assure the Syrians that you're not just going to kind of agree to a plan with these major stakeholders, which and I would assume would have to have buy-in from the Syrian government if you're going to have this transition from an Assad-led government, that you're not just going to have this plan and hand it to them and say, this is how, this is what you're supposed to implement? Yes, I can assure you of that. So, you said that the Secretary will be leaving tomorrow. The meetings will be held Thursday or Friday? I think they'll, again, the schedule is still being fleshed out. Um, uh, my understanding is uh, key meetings will be on Friday, but I can't rule out that there may not be some preliminary discussions uh, on Thursday. So John. the total that you expect is still roughly a dozen? Um, or, I think I think that's about more? I think that's about right, Matt. But again, uh, uh, when I have more that I can right. say about participants, I will. And then the other thing is a lot of the questions that you were being asked was that you have it's it, who who actually does the inviting for this, or does it depend on who the invitee is? I, that, I think that's. I, I mean, say say who who would you? I mean, is it the host, the Austrians? Or, who, who would do the inviting? I think, let me, I know where your question's going. When, you, when you're getting at multilateral settings at this level and of this importance, I think it's fair to say that various People stakeholders in, uh, in these discussions have, their, have ideas about whom they would want to be participating, and those discussions are ongoing, and it's sort of a multilateral approach right. to the okay. invitations So would themselves. it be fair to, to, to assume that the core four of this, the people who met last week, U.S., Russia, or, uh, Saudi, and uh, Turkey, would be doing the inviting for the people that, that for the countries that they... I, I, would, I would say that uh, certainly those f four core countries, as you put it, that met last week, um, have, uh, have all had an opportunity to voice uh, their views about who should be uh, participating. Right, but they would, once there's a consensus on who should participate, those countries would ask their, the, the countries that they wanted, that they have a particular I don't know that it's that cut and dry, but the, you've got the basic uh, idea. What is it, an evite, paperless post? <laughs> what, how, you know, how I, it, I, uh, at, at the risk of using, at the risk of using a word that I know the Associated Press hates, I don't know the exact Modality. modalities of the invitation. Right, okay, and last one for me on this I just thing. wanted to say it This meeting is being held in Vienna. Does this mean that Vienna has now, at least in uh, 
the Secretary's mind, overtaken Geneva as the uh, um, as the spot, the most valuable uh, venue. Secretary for values uh, the importance of both cities and the leadership in both countries in terms of helping us uh, arrive at diplomatic solutions to very thorny national security problems. Uh, John, uh, Russia wants uh, <laughs> Egypt to participate in these meetings too. Do you want Egypt to be part? I'm of not going to get into specific. Uh, you know, I, I, I addressed Iran because there had been some press reporting this afternoon about Iran's potential participation. I think you can understand that I'm just not at a point now where I can speak to or will speak to each and every possible participant and who wanted whom at the table. When we have more information about the agenda and about participants, I will I will provide it. Just to be clear, and I know we've gone over this, said that they had already been invited, and you're just saying that's not true. You're saying they will be, but you're not in stating that, actually issuing the invite yourself right now. I, I think I'm going to leave it the way I, I did 10 or 15 minutes ago. Okay. We anticipate that they will be asked to participate. We could keep going. Or on. will it, or were? We could, Justin, but... Uh, we could keep uh, going. The I bottom think, line is the United States is not doing the invitation or the asking to Iran, I'm not right? going to talk about so you don't who's know asking whom whether, to whether the it has event. been asked or not. I'm just telling you that we anticipate Iran will be uh, invited uh, to participate right. in these discussions. The thing is, is that you don't know that they haven't been invited. I'm just going to leave it with right. I What exactly. role do you expect Iran to play in these? in these discussions? I mean, you, you expect them to have an active role? Yesterday, I believe that you, you thought that at this stage you wouldn't expect Iran to have an active... No, I don't, think, active I, I don't think I put it right. I don't think I put it I'm quite that to, way. Yeah. But, but you used active in, in that sentence yesterday. I, you know, they, look, first of all, when an invitation is proffered, it's up to Iran to decide whether to accept it. And as I said earlier, it's up to them to decide if they are going to accept who they're going to send. And it's certainly up to Iran about how active they want to be and constructive they want to be in that discussion. I mean, obviously, uh, there would be no, th there wouldn't be an interest in in having them participate if there wasn't a general desire by the international community for them to play a constructive role in terms of achieving a political transition. Um, but that, those, you know, how they participate and at what level and. How energetically and how constructive, that's that's going to be up to uh, Iranian leaders to determine. John, last, last question for me. Do you expect Saudi Arabia to attend since uh, uh, Iran is invited? I appreciate your effort to try to get me to give you the invite list. When I have more... If Saudi well, Arabia I mean, was attending. The we could whole. go down the list of countries uh, uh, in the world if you Very want, well. but I am... Suriname. <laughs> I, when, I have more, when I have more about... Participants, okay. thank you, Matt, uh, for the geography lesson. When I have more about participants, uh, I will provide it. John, this is a follow-up to Elise's question um, concerning the moderate Syrian opposition. Um, you indicated they would have a role at some point. Do you anticipate an invitation will be extended for Friday's talks? Uh, when I have more about participation that I can offer you, I will do so. Uh, I alluded to one other country in particular because of press reporting this afternoon. Uh, and when I have more, we'll provide it. When Iran receives that invitation from another power or any power, can they assume that that power offers it to them with the blessing of the United States? What I would say is... Um, or that you won't oppose it. Any, an invitation to Iran to participate, um, I think Iranian leaders can take to mean that it's a genuine... Uh, and multilateral invitation to participate. Yes. South China Sea? Sure. Um, as we know that, um, I mean, China says it warned and tracked U.S. warship in South China Sea. And China's foreign ministry said the action had threatened um, China's sovereignty and security interests. At the same time, Beijing summons uh, U.S. ambassador over this issue. So do you think U.S. action uh, has some influence on U.S.-China relationship? I think with respect to that, this particular operation, I'm going to point you back to what the Secretary of Defense said earlier today in testimony, where he talked about this. Uh, and I think that's the appropriate level for discussion of specific military operations uh, uh, to, uh, to come from, uh, not from, not from me. Um, as for our diplomatic discussions, you know we don't talk about that. 
uh, what I can tell you is, the specifics of them anyway, what I can tell you is that this is a, a matter that we have routinely raised, this issue of, uh, of uh, these, uh, these claims in the South China Sea. We've routinely raised them with uh, our Chinese counterparts and will continue to do so. Um, and as I said yesterday, uh, that uh, freedom of navigation is a, is a, a right, it's a principle. Um, and that uh, regardless of this or any other specific operation, um, it's a responsibility that uh, the U.S. Navy takes seriously. Again, I'll let them speak to the specifics, but there's – setting this aside, okay, the U.S.-China relationship is vitally important and one that we want to see continue to improve and to grow for the benefit of both our countries, not to mention the region. Uh, so. Uh, Again, without speaking to specific operations, uh, it's the Secretary's desire that our relationship with China uh, will continue to deepen. But because, uh, because that Ambassador Bob on, is say, on, so according to the diplomats, that um, there were apparent differences of views between Pentagon and the White House um, about the wisdom of such action. So we can see the delay of matching tough words and action. So. Um, I'm just curious why United States spending so many weeks to um, take this final decision, and did the State Department evaluate the consequence of this issue beforehand? What I can tell you is that, uh, first of all, this is a military operation. Yes. And the Defense Department should speak to whatever details they wish to speak to. Again, I would point you to what Secretary Carter said earlier in testimony. Um, you couch it as, you know, how, you know, weeks and weeks to decide this. I mean, I, I don't know how you can know that unless, you know, you knew when an idea was, was initially proffered. Um, and that's really something for the U.S. military to, to speak to. Um, but what I would only go back to say is that uh, Freedom of navigation in international waters is an essential principle. It's, it's, it's why – it's one of the reasons why a, a nation has a navy, um, and it's an important principle uh, to, uh, to exercise and to be able to demonstrate. Um, and, and when you conduct freedom of navigation operations in international waters, they are in international waters and therefore aren't aimed or directed and shouldn't be construed as a threat by anybody. Last question, operation? last question. So U.S. repeated that U.S. will not take position on South China Sea on sovereignty claims. But at the same time, we can see um, President Obama when he met President Xi Jinping, and he said, narrow our differences, we can continue to advance our mutual interests. Uh, as you just mentioned, how important the China-U.S. relationship it is. But at the same time, we can see the action, which is kind of very contrary to the words. What, what is your comment? There's no there, – again, I'm not – I can appreciate you want me to talk in great detail about Navy operations in the Pacific. I won't do that. There is no change to our policy and position on the disputed claims in the South China Sea. None. We're not taking a position on any of these individual claims. We do take a position on coercion, that, that these disputes should not be solved through uh, aggressive actions or coercion or force of any kind. Number three, that we want them, we want them resolved through international norms and in accordance with international law. No change, none whatsoever, regardless of what the U.S. Navy did or didn't do recently. There's no change in our position. Uh, and the – the is operating, country, the sailing, that, the, the sailing of, of Navy ships in international waters doesn't change that one iota, not one. John, can yeah. you confirm that Am Ambassador Bacchus was summoned wow. to a meeting in, in China and protested? As this? you know, we don't confirm the details of diplomatic conversations. The, the <laughs> when meetings take place, I mean, I'm not well, asking yes, you to say what they talked about. There have been plenty of times from that podium, even you have said when an ambassador has gone in and met with the foreign minister. I mean, just because you guys don't like the, the reason that they were called in. I mean, he was called in. Why can't you say that he met with the ministry? We don't, we don't discuss the details of diplomatic conversations, but what I will Unless say – Unless you want to. What, what I will say is that 
is that this is a matter we have routinely discussed with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing and, and will continue to do so. The Including Chinese Sudan. Foreign Ministry has called this a provocation. Were you, were you surprised by the uh, tenor of the response from China? Given that you continue to assert that it's, uh, you know, it's a right, it's freedom of navigation, it's universal principle, and, and this and that. All I can, I can't speak for uh, China uh, and what they, you know, w what they interpreted it as or not. I can just tell you that, uh, as I said yesterday, this is a fundamental principle, and re regardless of, and again, I'm not going to speak about details here, operational details. Um, it, it's a, it's a fundamental. Principle, and you've heard me say before that freedom of the seas is not just for whales and icebergs, right? And this is about freedom of the seas. Okay, but I'm, I'm not asking you to, to speak about the Chinese position. They said it's a provocation. It, the Secretary of Defense. They can said speak it for themselves on, on on how they viewed the operation. I can only tell you uh, that, from our perspective, um, the Secretary uh, Secretary Carter certainly made clear that that U.S. military forces will fly, sail, and operate in accordance with international law, as they need to, to properly I, defend our national security interests. Right, but the question is, were you surprised or taken aback somehow by the Chinese reaction to this action? No. Which we know. No. no. You, okay. Yeah, John, but the U.S. hasn't done this kind of operation in the past three years. So why now, and especially sending a destroyer warship this time, this lead people to question your motivation. Are you tra trying to change the status quo in South China Sea, or what are you trying to change? I'm not going to speak about the details, details of military operations. I'd refer you to my colleagues at the Defense Department. I would only point you back to what mm -hmm. I said yesterday, that exercising freedom of navigation is an essential principle and one, of the, and one responsibility uh, of the United States Navy. Um, Assistant Secretary Daniel Russell said after President Xi's visit, he actually praised President Xi's commitment to South China Sea um, about the no militarized, um, no militarization in South China Sea and peaceful um, resolution to solve the problems. So by doing this, isn't this going to undermine the outcomes of the two leaders' summit? There's no reason that, uh, that U.S. Navy operations in international waters in accordance with international law, should have any negative effect on our relationship with any country around the world. Yes. Go ahead, Jenny. Yeah, John, uh, nice to see you. South Korea and Japan and China will hold uh, trilateral summit talks next week. Uh, what is the United States' view of these uh, three uh, rather uh, Well, we, I, I mean, just in, in broad terms, Jenny, we uh, we welcome uh, conversations and opportunities uh, for nations, uh, those three in particular, to to get together and discuss security issues. So, uh, I mean, we're very supportive of this, but obviously the goals and agendas for the, those three nations to um, uh, to speak to. But we continue to believe that strong and constructive relations between all those states uh, will eventually and could support, should support regional peace and prosperity. On six-party talks, do you have any uh, time frame for the resumption of six-party talks, or no, I don't. do you have, does the United States have a uh, to end the uh, North Korean nuclear deal before the end of this uh, administration? No, I don't have anything don't that, have? In, in detail to, to speak to with respect to that. As we've said all along, we want to see the, the, uh, the complete verifiable denuclearization of the peninsula. The onus is on the North Korea uh, to, uh, to begin to, to in, in not just word but in action and deed, uh, show their commit, commitment to that, um, and they've yet to do that so far. Thank you. Yeah, Pam. One more on South China Sea. I know you said that you won't confirm the diplomatic conversations, but can you say if China filed a formal protest, and if so, what was the U.S. response? I would let um, the Chinese speak to uh, the degree to which they did or didn't uh, well, what protest. what about the U.S. response? I, I, I'm not – I think I'm going to leave my answer the way it was. Um, I'm not going to speak to the details of diplomatic conversations, regardless of the degree to which may, I may or may not have done it in the past. Um, but um, it is an issue, the South China Sea writ large, uh, and the issue of claims and the issue of militarization of, of, of reclaimed features 
is something that uh, Ambassador Bacchus routinely talks to, to Chinese authorities on, and I suspect that those, those conversations will continue. Uh, may I, may sure. I come back to see you for a, for a second? I'm sorry. I, uh, I've meant to come over for a briefing for a long time, but it's been a very busy time. Well, it's great to have uh, you back. Th th thank you. Uh, on, on, on Syria, on, on Russia, I, I think I just heard you refer to Russia as a, as a partner or a potential partner. Uh, in uh, resolving the city, Syrian situation, correct? Yeah, uh, sure. So, uh, does it mean that uh, your uh, previous critical uh, attitude towards uh, Russia has been doing in Syria for the past few weeks uh, has changed? No, not at all. No. How, how do you square the two? Well, even the uh, even countries that are completely aligned on many issues mm -hmm. can disagree on others. Um, and uh, uh, there are issues where uh, we share common concerns uh, with Russia. And there, there are issues where there has been and we hope will continue to be um, good cooperation. And I would just point you back to the Iran deal and the very helpful role that Russia played uh, in achieving that. Uh, that doesn't mean that though we can partner with Russia on one thing, that we're going to have significant differences of approach in others. Uh, nothing has changed about our yes. concerns. Yeah. Hey, let me finish now. You asked a question. Yeah. Nothing is concerned. Nothing has changed about our significant concerns about what Russia is doing in Ukraine, mm -hmm. and we're not turning a blind eye to that either. Um, and obviously, we continue to have concerns about Russian military support for the Assad regime in Syria. Mm -hmm. As the secretary has said, if Russia wants to play a constructive role against ISIL in Syria, well, then that's a conversation we're more than willing to have. Mm -hmm. and an opportunity where there could be some measure of partnership. But we aren't there yet. If you just look at what they're hitting mm -hmm. and where they're continuing to focus on, obviously you're not there yet. There is also an opportunity here, back to Matt's question about vernacular, there is an opportunity here for there to be a partnership with respect to getting at a political transition in Syria. Are we there mm -hmm. yet? I don't know that I would describe it quite like that because these discussions are still ongoing. Yes. But obviously, you guys have seen the many readouts that I issue uh, when the Secretary speaks to Foreign Minister Lavrov, and I know that the other side does the same thing. There continues to be an ongoing conversation and dialogue between Foreign Minister Lavrov and Secretary Kerry about the political situation in Syria and about what options there can be for a transition. Was there one today? Or was there the last one yesterday? Uh, there was one yesterday. And I think I talked about that from yeah. the podium. Yeah, but there wasn't. But there, was, there, wasn't not, one there hasn't today. been one today, no. at least so, so far. So, uh, at least so far. If, if I may pursue this line of uh, questions, uh, you, you, sure. keep, you keep talking about partnership in a political transition. The Russians keep talking about uh, partnership in fighting ISIS. And there are actually this multilateral coalition of fighting ISIS with the participation of Iran and other regional players, Egypt and others, yeah. uh, was originally their idea. Uh, are they partners uh, for you in fighting ISIS? No. No, they aren't. Uh, are they potential partners <laughs> in fighting ISIS? It's going to be up to the Russians uh, to determine uh, the degree uh, to which they're very they're, they're serious about going after ISIL. They've not proven serious about doing that so far. Are, are they still uh, proceeding from the position of, from a position of weakness in your eyes in fighting ISIS? They're not fighting ISIS. They are. Oh, June. I, I mean. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. there, there, there's very little evidence that they're going after ISIL inside Syria. Mm -hmm. If they want to play a constructive role in that effort, then again, that's a conversation we're willing to have. At the same time, mm -hmm. there needs to be, and there is, and there will be, discussions on a political track. There mm -hmm. has to be uh, on trying to achieve a political transition in Syria because ultimately that's the answer to the civil war and that's the answer to stability in the country writ large and that's that's a harder thing to get at and that's why we're having these you know continued meetings and continued discussions when, when, when you say that you uh, they are proceeding from a position of weakness i assume that you mean that you are proceeding from a position of strength uh, what have you achieved in in uh, the la in the last couple of years proceeding in syria and iraq from position of strength what are your major achievements i have talked in fighting isis i appreciate uh, 
-hmm. where your question's coming from, mm -hmm. though the premise of it is completely false. And I have talked about... You don't really appreciate it. I, I'm trying to be polite. The, look, I, I'm not going to take the next 10 minutes to go over uh, the progress that we made against ISIL over the last uh, year plus. Uh, I have talked about it. I can refer you to my past transcripts about this. Uh, it's, uh, unquestionably, the coalition, and it's not just the United States, by the way, it's 65 nations involved in coalition operations against on multiple lines of effort against ISIL, and there has been progress. Is it is it over? No. Uh, ISIL remains a determined lethal enemy. Now look, wait, you're you're not listening. And I'm, I want, I'm listening. No, you, you I'm listening. You don't I'm, appear I'm, to be. I'm, I'm taping. You on don't appear to be, and I I'm think this is important context. I'm taping. We on two are devices. we are working very hard against uh, ISIL, and there's a lot of work left to be done. And if Russia wants to play a role in that. So much the better. Let's have a, a talk about that. <clears throat> and so far, when you just look at the, the vast majority of the targets they're hitting, they're hitting opposition groups uh, and not terrorist organizations and not ISIL specifically. But you don't think well, that the Russian operations on the ground have given this new momentum to the desire to kind of get together more urgently for a political solution? There's a, there's a lot of factors that have gone into... Um, uh, the the president's decision, and certainly Secretary Kerry's support for that position, that we need to intensify our efforts against ISIL. Um, but you've that, been doing that for months, though, and it does seem in the recent weeks, as Russia has increased its presence and started launching airstrikes, that now Russia has kind of seized this momentum and, you no, know, I would, along, I would, along I would with not, you, along no, with you no. got, let me finish, along with you guys, <laughs> to get together this meeting. I mean, it definitely seems as if the urgency has come from the Russian actions on the ground, not respectfully anything you've done. No, I would disagree with that, okay. respectfully. Okay. Uh, the, the, the Syrian regime, as and I've talked about the increasing fragility, and that's what we believe prompted Russia to act militarily inside right, Syria, was reacting to, right. wait a second, reacting to increasing fragility of the Assad regime. And what they've done is emboldened Assad and now made it easier for him. And we've seen continued now action against opposition groups and civilians continue to be killed uh, by the regime. Uh, and we're also seeing as a result of these uh, military activities, more and more refugees flowing out of Syria. I think the refugee crisis in particular has certainly had um, uh, an effect on um, increased efforts and desire to intensify our, our work against uh, ISIL inside the, the country. But our focus militarily is against ISIL, always has been, remains that. Politically, what needs to happen is a transition in Syria and, um, and supporting the Assad regime, as so far military Russian activities, yeah, military Russian activities has done, is not going to get us any closer to that. Right. That said, hang on a second, that said, uh, it doesn't mean that, and I've said this before, that there shouldn't be a concerted effort to try to get at that political transition and to have conversations with Russia bilaterally and multilaterally to that end. Now, obviously, how, and, uh, how Russia reacts to that and the degree to which they want to be helpful in a political solution, well, that's up to them to speak to. Uh, but I would tell you that uh, the secretary views positively the fact that he continues to have meaningful conversations with Foreign Minister Lavrov on this, uh, and will do so again at the end of this week. Will the Foreign Minister oh. be there on Friday? I, I'm not going to speak for another nation and their uh, participation. Um, it is our expectation that Foreign Minister Lavrov will be there. Is, one, does it... one absolutely last thing that I wanted to ask you about this, and in the context of what you just said. Uh, why did you bomb the uh, power station in uh, in Syria? If if you say your military efforts are exclusively focused on ISIS, if you say you want to stop the flow of refugees, why did you bomb a Japanese-built power station in Aleppo? Destroyed it, creating uh, additional hardships for for the Syrians and probably causing some additional refugees to leave the country. Well, I'm not going to talk about specific bombing raids or operations, and don't look at it that way. Now, I'll, I'll, I've told you before, I'm not going to get into military operations from this podium. That's a great question for the Defense Department. Um, 
But let's talk about the thousands and thousands of other operations that have been done in Iraq and Syria, supported by the United States and United States air power, as well as other coalition members against targets on ISIL. I, I'm not going to be in a position, and I wouldn't begin to be in a position to, to, to speak to each and every uh, uh, target from each and every uh, operation. This subject was raised by President Putin. That's why I'm raising it. Uh, Fair. He, ap apparently, that, that raise it. Yes. You should raise it to the Defense Department. Can we move sir? a bit south? Yeah. Just to Israel, I've got a, I've got a couple, but they're really, they'll be really quick. One is you're probably aware that an American citizen who was um, uh, a victim of, a, of, of an attack uh, earlier this month died this morning. I'm wondering if you have anything to say about um, the hospital. Yeah, Matt, I do. Can you, can you just give me a second to find it here? We can confirm that U.S. citizen Richard Lakin... Uh, died this morning of wounds sustained in the October 13th terrorist attack on a bus in Jerusalem. Obviously, we express our deepest sympathies to his family and his loved ones for their loss. Um, and we have been in contact with his family uh, regarding this tragic death. Um, as we've made clear, in the wake of uh, that tragic incident itself, we condemned it in the strongest terms, and we con continue to, to condemn in the strongest terms terrorist attacks uh, such as this one. We... Uh, remain deeply concerned, obviously, about the tensions, and we continue to urge all sides to take affirmative steps to okay. restore calm. Um, uh, when the secretary, well, when the secretary was in Jordan and he announced this uh, camera, CC, you know, closed circuit television or whatever it's going to be, the, the cameras at the Temple Mount. Yeah. Um, so uh, the Jordanians have welcomed this. The Israelis have welcomed it. Um, FAC has wel welcomed it. Um, the only people who don't seem to be too thrilled about this idea are the Palestinians. Is this a disappointment to you? Do you think that, that this is a mistake, for them not embracing this proposal? I think we'd let the uh, Palestinian uh, authorities speak for themselves. On, well, they have of, spoken, uh, and they I, say they I'm think it's let, a trap. Well, we'll let, we'll let them speak for themselves. The secretary talked about this over the weekend. Um, he described it as a potential game changer. He still believes that it, it can be exactly that because of the increased transparency that would proffer uh, to allow all sides to see what's going on. So he's fully in support of the installation uh, and the use of these cameras. Well, okay, but I, I'm not asking you to speak for the Palestinians. I'm asking you to respond to find out whether or not you are disappointed or angry or whatever I think we'll at let the, the fact yeah. that they have not said that they are pleased with this idea and, and, and quite the opposite. They said they're suspicious of it because they think that it's 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 aimed at spying on them essentially. It's not aimed at spying on anybody. It's aimed at increasing transparency. So there's no reason for anybody to be suspicious about the use of closed circuit okay. cameras so any you, more than when you go shopping at Target or or Walmart and you're walking through the parking lot. There are there are cameras and uh, all that is to the betterment of. Uh, good order and safety. And so there's no reason for anybody to be suspicious of it. I'll let them speak for what they feel of it. The, okay, I'm no, not nothing has changed. I, I know that. You, you want me to characterize it, and I won't do that. I, in, in terms of characterizing their attitudes toward it, there's no reason for anybody to be suspicious of this particular idea, and the secretary okay. continues to believe it could be very, very helpful. All right. Did, did the secretary actually raise this with President Abbas when they met in Amman? The secretary talked to the uh, President Abbas about um, a range of things. Including the camera? I'm not going to get into uh, the specific details of that discussion, except to say he discussed with him a range of issues uh, that, uh, that he believed would be helpful in restoring calm you, and ending the violence. Do you know if the secretary spoke with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu about the camera idea when they met in Berlin on yes, Thursday? He, yeah, of, of course he did, because, I mean, the, the, the did, prime right? minister later came out and said uh, that he was in favor of it. Right, but there were conversations post-Thursday, phone conversations. Well, I, that again, I'm not going to get into well, details of I, every conversation. One on this. I mean, so you, you had very specific things that you were looking for the prime minister to do in terms of this camera, making this announcement about the status quo and the Temple Mount and such, but you are also looking for the President Abbas to take certain steps to try and end incitement and speak out in terms of violence against innocent civilians. Um, do you think that President Abbas has taken enough leadership in terms of trying to put an end to this kind of violence? 
we continue, at least in his public statements, we continue to want all sides, as I said earlier. That's not to, wasn't my question. I know that's not your question. You got to, we you want, want both sides, sides to take steps to and take you steps specifically to ratchet saw a, down the violence and you restore specifically calm. saw a step by Prime Minister Netanyahu, whether which we the welcomed, which you welcomed, but I don't see you welcoming any steps by President Abbas, maybe because that's he hasn't taken any. I'm going to leave it the way I said it. We, well, want, if you're we gonna, want all sides to, to take. Uh, affirmative actions, Secretary in word and indeed. Secretary Kerry specifically called on Palestinian leaders to speak out against incitement. Have you seen these statements? I would just say we continue to, to want that as the goal. We want... Well, by saying that you continue to want that, that would suggest that you haven't seen it. I think it's something that we want to see continuously observed, which is you know, a well, continuous are you effort. That now? We want to see a continuous effort by all sides. Well, are you seeing a continuous effort? We want to see a continuous effort by all sides going forward. I'm not going to get into, just like I said yesterday, I'm not going to get into characterizing uh, each and every incident uh, and each and every word that's uttered. What the I'm reason not he went on the trip. Like, I'm not asking for a specific statement that he made <clears throat> because I can't point to any specific statements that he made. I'm asking if you see a concerted effort by President Obama. We would, continue to, 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 we would continue to find helpful uh, statements on all sides that, that help lead to uh, the discouragement of violence uh, and a restoration of calm. Uh, John, a couple of weeks back, I had asked uh, you, you weren't here, Mark. I asked Mark, though, this was about UNRWA. Um, the UN Relief and Works Agency, um, and some of its employees who, uh, some, a group found that they're posting incite, inciting, incitement kind of uh, stuff on their social media pages. You said that, or Mark said at the time, that you'd be looking for an investigation of this by UNRWA. There was an investigation, and in fact, some of their employees were suspended um, for this. Um, are you satisfied with, with the steps that, the, that they've taken? Uh... I don't know if I've got something for okay. you. Okay. Well, the reason I, maybe you could take the question. And the reason I'm asking is because that it has come to light that the spokesman for UNRWA uh, recently, or I think over the course of the weekend, spoke uh, to a group in London or to a London based group that is actually designated a um, special, uh, is a specially designated global uh, terrorist group by the United States. And I'm just wondering if that would fall into the same category of. Things that are concerning. So, if you could take that question, I things would that are concerning. All right. Well, Wait. things that are concerning about this, but you I'll know, take, this I'll one. take the, I'll take the question. I got time for just a couple more. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Um, Japanese government has uh, overturned the decision um, taken by the Okinawan governor to rescind approval for landfill work in Futema. Do you welcome this action by uh, the Japanese government, or do you have any comment on it? All I would say is what we, we've said before, and that's that uh, we continue to work with the government of Japan uh, and we uh, and remain committed to working with the government of Japan um, to implementing the relocation of the Marine Corps Air Station uh, Futemna to Camp Schwab. Uh, we're going to continue to we're, – we're committed to it. The government of Japan is committed to it. Um, and, uh, and construction at the Futemna replacement facility – uh, we believe is a meaningful result of many years of sustained work between uh, our two governments and is a critical step toward realizing our shared vision for the realignment of U.S. forces on Okinawa. Some of the criticism is that it's going to worsen uh, the relationship between the central government and the local government, and that can have long-term effects in actually realizing the, the facility. Do you, have, do you share that concern? I think I'm going to leave it where I did. Uh, we're going to continue to work with the government of Japan uh, to, for, for this uh, relocation, which we continue to believe is, is vital to uh, realignment of our, our force posture there. Yeah. Cover up that. Cover up. Huh? Um, the Japanese minister explained why he decided that, because um, Japan and the United States relationship it will be damaged and uh, destroyed if the uh, Japanese government do nothing. Do you think uh, is a uh, um, is this a true for if a Japanese government is not doing this issue? Is that Are we still talking about Futemna? Yeah, about Futemna, yeah. That uh, US, um, U.S. and Japan relationship will be damaged or destroyed. Do I believe that as a result think, of moving forward yeah, because, on the Futemna uh, replacement yeah. facility, our relationship with Japan will be destroyed? If yeah, would, because, uh, yeah. Because our Japanese minister explained why he decided that 
uh, because uh, the um, Japan and U.S. relationship will be damaged if your Japanese uh, government do nothing. This case. I'm not going to speculate or get into hypotheticals. Uh, we have an extraordinarily close relationship, friendship, partnership, and alliance with Japan that we value very, very much. And we have every expectation will continue to grow and deepen and strengthen. And we've talked about in the past how, uh, how we, we welcome uh, the Japanese government's uh, efforts to review their defense guidelines and to look for ways themselves to, to deepen that partnership and that alliance. Nothing that I can see is going to change the commitment by other nations um, to the strength of this alliance. Um, as I said before, we both are committed to this relocation. We believe it's in the best interest of the alliance. It's in the best interest of the U.S. military and the force posture uh, there. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue to, to work through that. I, I won't, and I've been very careful not to talk about internal Japanese politics. That's for, uh, that's for the people of Japan to speak to. What I can tell you is nothing has changed, and we don't anticipate any change in the future uh, to our strong partnership, friendship, and alliance with, with Japan and the Japanese people. Yeah, Pam? There have been cons Did you have a follow-up? Um, no. Oh. There have been concerns raised um, among some in Turkey about the upcoming elections on Sunday, the parliamentary elections, and whether they will be free and fair. Uh, this comes after Assistant Secretary Nuland was, was, of course, in Turkey. What concerns did she raise while there? Well, I, again, I, I'm not going to get into uh, details of uh, diplomatic uh, discussions. But as, as we've said before, uh, Turkey's democracy matters to us. And, uh, and just like we've said elsewhere, uh, when we're talking about democratic elections, we want to – obviously, we want to see them be free and fair and credible. But I won't speak to the specifics uh, of uh, Ambassador Newland's discussions. Follow up, Turkey. this time for the Secretary's trip to Central Asia to come back to the very beginning of our brief? A particular time? Yeah, just, just a little. Well, time. there's this opening that we talked about of the uh, university, um, and um, there's an awful lot going on in the region. Um, yes. And when you're talking about uh, trying to coordinate the schedules of six nations to mm -hmm. meet, I mm -hmm. mean, oftentimes it's just a matter of the logistics of, of like scheduling. That. but uh, So, I mean, I think it was really more of that than anything else. Yes, in the back. Turkey, I'll come back to you, Matt. You'll be the last one. The Turkish government has seized a prominent opposition business conglomerate, which also owns an influential media group. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, we said, you heard me talk about this uh, before. We, uh, uh, you know, we, we look to governments everywhere to ensure uh, that legal enforcement activity is done in accordance with uh, international legal standards, and that includes the full respect for due process and equal treatment under the law. Um, we also have been very clear that, uh, that we continue to urge Turkish authorities to uh, ensure their actions uphold universal democratic values, values that are enshrined in uh, uh, the, the Turkish government and constitution itself, uh, including due process, freedom of expression, and assembly, and of course, access to media and information. So we continue to, 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 to have the same concerns that we've had before in terms of um, the, the, the right to free media and free speech and assembly. Okay. And what is your assessment about the impl uh, on its, its impact on elections, considering that only le days left to the elections? I'm sorry, I did not understand uh, your question. What is your assessment uh, on its impact? on election, considering just I'm not going to prognosticate uh, in terms of what uh, effect it will or won't have. I, I think we, we, uh, I've raised the concern here. We continue to raise it uh, uh, privately and publicly. Um, and uh, obviously, the, the, the direction of Turkey's uh, government is for the Turkish people to decide, not for the United States to dictate here from this podium. I've got well, two. The, those are from the opposite opposite, absolute opposite spectrum. Uh, one, Saudi, uh, the wife of the uh, blogger who's been imprisoned and uh, was sentenced to be flogged and the first 
part of the sentence was carried out, but then it was suspended. The, his wife says now that she's been told that uh, the flogging is going to continue. Do you, uh, one, have any comment about that? And two, since the secretary was just in Saudi Arabia on Saturday, I'm wondering if this, uh, if this case, I know, uh, well, I'm wondering if this case or human rights in general came up in his discussions there, or if it was at all Syria. Well, we routinely raise um, yes, but, issues of concerns of the But about did it come up on rights, Saturday? Uh, uh, the, um, the focus of this Saturday's discussions was primarily on okay. the situation in Syria. Obviously, uh, you know, we're, uh, uh, we remain deeply concerned by this case, um, and we continue to call on the government of Saudi Arabia to respect universal human rights and its international obligations, as well as to ensure fair and transparent judicial proceedings that afford requisite fair trial procedures and safeguards. Sorry. And this and any other case. Okay, but you, do, do your position remains that flogging is not a, an appropriate... Uh, uh, nothing's changed about right. our, our, our view on... Uh, All right, on these uh, and then the last one is, um, you were probably aware of a lawsuit that was filed yesterday against Secretary Kerry and the State Department about gender and passport applications? Yeah, I'm aware. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm not going to let you get away with saying it's a matter of being litigated so you can't get into it because I don't want to ask about the lawsuit. I want to ask why it is that the State Department does not have a third option for gender, right, either no gender or X, on passport applications. Why, why not? I, I am <laughs> not... At liberty to discuss uh, a matter. This has of nothing to no, do. No, Matt, hang on a second. No. Yeah, I just go ahead. Bring it on. <laughs> Bring it. On. Bring it on. I'm not at, at liberty to uh, discuss um, a, a matter under litigation. Uh, uh, what I could just tell you is that, uh, as stated in in the Foreign Affairs Manual. Um, one's uh, gender is considered to be an essential element of one's identity. I think I'd have to leave it at that. Yeah, exactly. So if you do not identify with either gender that you have uh, put down I'm on not there, gonna, what should... I can't go any if that's, deeper than that. Can you, can, well, can you take the question and find out if there's a... It, find out what it actually is that prevents the State Department from doing this, because uh, or offering this, offering this option, quite apart from the lawsuit? I, that would be nice. I will do what I Thank can. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Gotta go.